Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is a fresh talk radio approach promoting happiness from the inside out. Happiness is a choice and happiness can be cultivated and harvested. Each week, Lisa shines her light on well-being and global human flourishing by presenting a diverse and proactive collection of the greatest thinkers and doers who have devoted their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Lisa Cypress Kamen is a widely recognized applied positive psychology coach, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in the fields of sustainable happiness, mindfulness, and integrated well-being. Let's get to it. Here's your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen. Welcome to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio, broadcasting consciously prepared brain food from the beaches of Malibu, California. Today's show is brought to you by Casper.com, Casper Mattresses, and we're going to talk a little bit more about my experience with Casper a little bit later on in the show. Each week, we explore the very serious business of happiness, sustainable well-being, and human flourishing. We are not talking about that annoying yellow smiley face. No, no, no. We are talking about something much deeper and critical to the success of humanity. Authentic happiness is not selfish, egotistical, or narcissistic. In fact, it is essential in order for humankind to thrive. Sustainable happiness is important because it not only elevates our own well-being locally, but also contributes to collective global flourishing. The achievement of a happy life is not only positively good for us, it is constructively good for those around us. In short, Happiness matters. Happiness comes from the heart, and this show is all about the heart. Today, we are talking about money, 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 money. We're talking about rebooting our relationship with the mighty dollar. Mm, This is something that I definitely need a tutorial on. Teresa Gilarducci is an expert on retirement pensions, and personal savings, and the Bernard L. and Irene Schwartz Chair in Economic Policy Analysis at the New School for Social Research. She has a Ph.D. in economics from the University of California, Berkeley, and taught previously at the University of Notre Dame. Her 2008 book, When I'm 64, The Plot Against Pensions and the Plan to Save Them, was recognized for containing the best economic idea of 2008 by the New York Times. Her book, Labor's Capital, The The Politics and Economics of Private Pensions, won the Association of American Publishers Award for the Best Business Book of 1992. Teresa has written for and been featured in the New York Times, Money, Kiplinger's, Business Week, U.S. News and World Report, Parade, and more. Her latest book, which I am holding in my hot little hands, is entitled How to Retire with Enough Money and How to Know What Enough Is. Welcome, Teresa. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Thanks for having me, Lisa. Well, this is a great... A, pl- a great pleasure, because we love talking about money, money and happiness. They go hand in hand, right? Absolutely, actually. Uh, money, happiness, and actually... You know, satisfaction, well-being. I really like to um, talk about that when people talk about what to buy. Is there a real difference between, you know, the rush you get when you buy something um, from a splurge and the satisfaction you get from controlling your financial future? Amen to that. As I, uh, uh, amidst many other tens or perhaps hundreds of millions of Americans have recovered slowly from this last recession... I have come to know that using my money wisely, both savings and to also invest in adventures over yes. objects. Yes, yes. You know, experience. And I think that that's where the relationship with money needs to be shifted. Um, I, well, I really agree with you. I mean, I am a professor of economics and I teach a class on um, work and, and happiness. You know, the, the economics of consumption. And I've learned a lot from brain scientists, you know, from neuroscientists, who distinguish between, you know, dopamine and serotonin. And um, the dopamine is the desire chemical. You know, that's what drives you kind of addicts, you know, to the mall. Um, it's the kind of um, nonsense around retail therapy. And what we find out is that the hit you get from buying an object um, actually doesn't last. Um, and if it adds to debt, 
or if it adds to the kind of nagging worry that you won't, that your future self won't be secure, then it actually is a detriment. So it's really important to save for retirement um, for your your mental um, well being. Agreed. Agreed. Let's talk about about your book because you give some wonderful tips about how to make money grow and getting yeah. our expenses under control. Yeah. So. Um, so let's you know talk about it from the point of view of recovering from the financial crisis. Um, you know, a lot of us you know have gotten our jobs back or um, we're still working, um, but our financial accounts um, aren't growing because the rate of return is pretty flat in the stock market, bond market's kind of shaky, and interest rates are really low. The only way to make your money grow in this environment is to knock down the fees. And what I'm really disgusted about is that our system of retirement savings is filled with predators. And so my book actually has the advice of firing your guy. Now, sometimes your financial advisor is a woman, but most of the time it's the guy um, who people say, well, I have this guy. He gives me really good financial advice, and I just cringe. Because these um, actively managed mutual funds, um, really promoted by these so-called brokers, are bleeding people dry. The only way to make your money grow that you really have a hard time saving is to um, make sure you scrub it of the high fees and um, and the kickbacks. This is great advice. And the other thing that comes to mind about getting control of the expenses is, and you talk about this in your book, really is about downsizing our expenses mm-hmm. as we get older. You know, we need less yeah. and to harness our costs. Yeah, so let's, let's talk about um, the first part of the book is about people's power as a, you know, as a consumer. Um, you've got a lot of power if you know where you are, you know, if you have a map. So it's really important uh, and I know everybody gets this advice, you know, since they're 15, um, but it really makes people happier when they know their monthly expenses. So get a budget and make sure in your budget is uh, paying off your debt. Because what people don't know is paying off your debt is a form of saving. And no debt is good. No debt is good, including, um, including your mortgage. And if you can't pay off your mortgage uh, before you're um, retired or you can't pay it off within... Um, eight to ten years, um, you're living in uh, a house or an apartment that's too expensive. Um, so it's important to know that paying off debt is a way to get a high rate of return um, on your income. Um, the other way um, to manage your money is to is to trick your brain and fall in love with your stuff. You know, if you have a closet full of shoes and you want more shoes, just reacquaint yourself with the shoes that you already have. Um, with all your <laughs> You know, with all your, you know, take the shoes you already have on a date. You know, romance your, you know, your, uh, your belongings um, because all that new stuff out there, you know, is not going to make you feel good. Um, also, uh, really make sure that the big items, um, the amount of money you're paying your financial advisor, um, the amount of money you're spending on um, being out with friends, and the amount of money you're spending on um, in your housing is under control. I mean, I, I say you can't actually get your expenses under control unless you're having a good time because money is social. So find um, friends that have the same, you know, kind of living standards you do, who have the same financial goals that you do, and make sure that they're fun, but make sure they're frugal. I love what you are just sharing because I am of um, a certain age, you know, in the ripe, mm-hmm. juicy middle, let's say, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 this is a goal of, of my life at present, is to really shore up, create a sense of stability, and not minimize pleasure or joy or feel that I'm in scarcity. Absolutely. It won't work if you are. It will not work if you're planning for your future self by deprivation. I mean, I feel enormously kind of smug and, um, and taller you know, like a, and and more sound when I paid off my mortgage in eight years. I mean, I, it was the opposite of deprivation. It was a great deal of satisfaction. And it turns out, if I actually talk about this, and, and now you know, I've written this book, I do more publicly. But if I just demonstrate to my friends and my family, that's my goal. I actually get a lot of satisfaction, and I'm helping them feel better. 
Oh, and yes, and not only that, but you're teaching this. You're teaching this to young yeah. people, which I hope you are inspiring. Not hope. I know you are inspiring a generation ahead of responsible investors and fiscally responsible human beings. This is big. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and that you know really um, leads into being a responsible citizen. You know, and really knowing about the um, the government plans that are that are helpful to us. Um, Social Security and Medicare are enormously valuable to people. Um, For a new retiree, those programs are worth about a million dollars. And we have to steward those, um, you know, carefully as well. We are going to go to a break in a minute. Uh, But before we do, I want you to just chat a little bit about that, because everybody thinks, oh, Social Security, there's not going to be enough. It's what is it going to do for us? What we're going to get just a few hundred dollars a month or maybe a thousand at best. And really what I'm hearing you say is something very, very different. And we only have a few seconds. So if you can give us the the cliff note on that and then we'll come back and talk more, it would be great. Okay. Yeah, no, Social Security is um, the most valuable retirement asset you have, and it is in debt for inflation, and if you delay collecting Social Security, you get a, the best deal on the planet, you get a 6 to 8% return on your money if you delay collecting. So Social Security is a very strong economically and political, uh, politically strong program. Well, we're going to go to a break. And before we do, I want to give our listeners your contact information. Once again, the book is How to Retire with Enough Money and How to Know What Enough Is by Teresa Gillarducci. And to find you on Facebook, um, you know what? Yeah. You're going to have to tell me that because I, I, I don't have it on my sheet. But the website is <laughs> TeresaGillarducci.org. And on Twitter, you are at T. Gillarducci. And when we come back, you can give us that Facebook handle. Here come the tunes and we'll be back. We promise. We know that life can be tough and that happiness can and does live alongside adversity. We'll be right back to explain how on Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen. Harvest more happiness by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness, following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen, and tweeting us with the hashtag Harvesting Happiness. Love to read? Looking to harvest your happiness? Then look no further. Lisa Cypress Kamen is an author of three amazing books that will assist in taking your well-being and self-mastery to the next level. Are we happy yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life offers breakthrough strategies for creating your own personal happiness revolution. Perspectives on Addiction, an Integrated Journey to Wellness is an overview of the recovery process from a multi-stepped perspective and holistic approach of substance abuse and lifestyle management. Through her third book, Reintegration Strategies for Depression, Anxiety, Anger, Grief, and Post-Traumatic Stress, offers an own nonsense approach to dealing with post-combat civilian life reintegration issues for veterans and their families. You'll find these books online at Amazon.com and HarvestingHappiness.com. Mindful meditative moments are free and relaxing on-the-spot mini staycation journeys designed to calm the mind and soothe the body from the comfort of wherever you are. No reservations or travel required. Check out the playlists on HarvestingHappiness.com and Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio on iTunes and SoundCloud. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen, the show dedicated to promoting happiness from the inside out by thriving with passion, purpose, place, and meaning. So let's get back to the show and your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen. So before we went to the break, we were talking with Teresa Gelarducci about our money, about retirement. And Teresa was talking about how the Social Security system really is one of our most valuable assets, which is startling to me. Teresa, I would love for you to explain a little bit more about that. Yeah, so Social Security is a pay-to-go system. We pay um, a payroll tax um, into the system, and it pays out um, benefits when we get um, older. The system um, does need more revenue, but it's actually easy to get without hurting the economy or anybody else. All the experts know. So right now, people pay tax up to $118,500 per year. So um, if you ever hit that mark, you stop paying Social Security tax. Most of us pay tax through the whole year because most of us make less 
spend $118,500 per year. But there are many rich people who make a lot more than that. Many people like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, uh, rich people you've never heard of, stop paying their Social Security tax the first week of January. Some people are so rich they stop paying you know, New Year's um, Day. If we just make everybody pay Social Security tax throughout the entire year, there would be enough money going into the system to uh, expand the system and make it solvent for the next 100-plus years. So the um, Social Security system is very strong. Um, it also um, gives you a lifetime inflation index benefit, and it also provides um, a benefit for your, um, for your dependents um, after you die or or to your spouse while, while you're still married. It's really the best deal on the planet. And the way to maximize the benefit, if, if you want me to talk about sort of a personal strategy. Of course. It's all personal. Oh, this okay. is very personal. Right, so, <laughs> yeah, so it's like everyone needs to know that it's a good system to in, in, invest in. And you invest in it by voting for politicians that will expand and strengthen it. Okay, but for a personal, from a personal point of view, uh, it turns out if you delay collecting your Social Security, I mean, you can retire, but if you can delay collecting your Social Security, um, then you get an increase in that lifetime benefit every year you delay. So if you delay collecting at 62, on um, the 63, you get a 6.5% or a little more return on that delay. Your benefit goes up by 6-plus um, um, amount. If you delay collecting from 67 to 70, you get an 8% return every year you delay collecting. And there's no deal better on the planet to get a 6 to 8% guaranteed return. So I suggest to people, anybody who comes near me you know, during retirement, to delay collecting. I actually heard a story of a janitor in a Social Security Administration office and he was overhearing um, people debating, you know, in the waiting room whether or not they should collect the 62. And the janitor walked over um, to the to the retirees to say, "Whatever you do, delay collecting." You know, because he learned about that, you know, just being a janitor in the Social Security office. So it's a really important message. It is. It's one that I have heard, and I even heard a delay till 70. Yeah, if you can, you know. Um, um, delay collecting to 70. The difference between your, your lifetime Social Security benefit from collecting at 62 to 70 is over 35%. You know, you max out your benefit if you wait until 70, and then you have that um, huge increase for the rest of your life. Wow. These are really um, simple tips, but one that if we're not plugged in, if we're not attuned to it, and in fact, if we were never educated to pay attention because everybody is telling us Social Security is a joke, which is clearly not the case, how would we know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. If any expert um, says, hey, um, this system is really good, I travel all over the world, and when they learn about the American Social Security system, they say, oh, wow, it's a lot better than we ever thought, you know, because we have a bad reputation for not taking care of our old people. You know, we have really high poverty rates among our elderly, but people are pleasantly surprised to hear about how strong our system is. You know, we have well, a young I country. You know, we have a lot of immigrants, a lot of young people working, um, so that keeps the system strong, too. There is a statistic that you quote in your book or uh, uh, some guidance you give in the book about a comfortable nest egg is eight times your annual salary. Now, that's going to be yeah. shocking for some people. Yeah, you know, it's kind of the minimum comfort level, too. So that means if you're going to spend $50,000 um, in your retirement, you need um, $400,000 at retirement in addition to your Social Security um, to, to maintain your lifestyle. Now, People who have been saving in their retirement accounts um, since they started working actually easily get to that amount, you know, because they've basically not taken money out. Um, they've been forced to contribute. Maybe their employer contributed. Um, but for a lot of people having to do it on their own, it's um, pretty tough. And I'm really sympathetic um, um, to how tough it is in my book. I don't make people feel ashamed for not kind of navigating this do-it-yourself system. Um, but I do help people, you know, kind of set, you know, press the reset button and get on track no matter how old they are. 
Well, this is really important, especially for those of us who perhaps lost our retirement. We thought we were headed to the good life, you know, up until 2008, 2009, and then boom. Yeah, you know, so I help people actually prepare, you know, for the next the next one. And the way that you can prepare is to be really aggressive and sharp elbows when it comes to your fees. And the only way that you can get a return and make your money grow is to avoid paying um, your financial, your so-called free financial advisor um, or your really high fee um, IRA um, 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 large investment fees that don't get you anything. I have no relationship to any bank or financial firm. I make money from my students. My university pays me a good salary. So I steer people with good conscience to Vanguard. Um, because that's a system that's a mutual company. It, it doesn't have shareholders except for the account holders, and they plow all their profits back into lower fees. So p- if people save in an IRA, they should save in Vanguard funds, and your 401K should have Vanguard index funds in them as well. Well, this is a great tip. Um, we are almost out of time, um, but before we go, I want to uh, – uh, give, t- want you to share a couple more tips. And one, which, which I find just very endearing, lovely, and so true, and that is about our self care in relationship to preparing for old age and yeah. retirement. Yeah. So um, I'm not going to give you bathing suit tips, you know, when you're 40 and 50. I'm going to give you a health tip, but it's the same advice. Um, keep your waistline within uh, normal measures. And uh, it means I like, keep your weight down and keep your muscles strong around your bones and keep your bones strong. Because if you don't, it's going to cost you up to a quarter million dollars a year, you know, your, your retirement if you have diabetes or a fall or a chronic health problem. So if you need another reason to exercise and to eat well, do it for your pocketbook. Um, really keep yourself strong and flexible because it'll save you money um, when you retire. We got to go because you got to scoot on to somewhere else. And I am just so delighted to have you on the air with me. The book, once again, is How to Retire with Enough Money and How to Know What Enough Is by Teresa Ghilarducci. To connect with her, please visit her website at TeresaGhilarducci.org. And on Twitter, you can connect with her at T Ghilarducci. We're going to pause for a break, but before we do, I want to mention the importance of a good night's sleep and how sleeping on a great mattress contributes to our happiness. For your information, I am sleeping with Casper. Yes, Casper Mattress is an online retailer of premium mattresses at a fraction of the cost. And here's why I love sleeping with Casper. Casper provides an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. It has just the right sink, just the right bounce, combining two technologies, a hybrid of latex foam and memory foam. Casper has a risk-free trial and return policy, so you should try sleeping on a Casper for 100 days with free delivery and painless returns. On top of which, all mattresses are made in America and their price point is really quite good. $500 for a twin size mattress and $950 for a king size mattress. Comparing this to industry averages, that is an absolutely outstanding price point. Here's a special offer for our show listeners. Get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting www.casper.com slash sleep happy. And don't forget to insert the promo code sleep happy. Terms and conditions apply. Here come those tunes. We will be right back with more. We know that life can be tough and that happiness can and does live alongside adversity. We'll be right back to explain how on Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress-Kamen. Harvest more happiness by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness, following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen, and tweeting us with the hashtag Harvesting Happiness. Remember what it feels like to receive a gift? We all know nothing gives happiness like a present, so you should unwrap yours at HarvestingHappiness.com and sign up to receive your free ebook, Got Happiness Now, that offers simple, user-friendly ways to get greater happiness in your world each and every day. That's HarvestingHappiness.com. 
Lisa Cypress Cayman has built an impressive global lifestyle management consulting company offering applied positive psychology, mindfulness, and integrated well-being coaching. Her services, including addiction and trauma recovery support, as well as life crisis triage, are available worldwide through phone, video, and on-site. In addition, Lisa delivers workshops, lectures, and trainings to corporations and institutions and is a frequent guest expert on many prominent radio and TV shows. Connect with us at HarvestingHappiness.com for more information. Harvesting Happiness for Heroes is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation offering innovative and integrated stigma-free combat recovery services to veterans and their loved ones with programming that focuses on the transformation of post-traumatic stress into post-traumatic growth using scientifically proven positive psychology coaching tools and strategies that increase self-mastery, self-awareness, and self-esteem to help heal the invisible wounds of war. To make a tax-free charitable contribution or to learn more, please visit visit hh4heroes.org. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen, the show dedicated to promoting happiness from the inside out by thriving with passion, purpose, place, and meaning. So let's get back to the show and your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. If you're just joining us now, we are talking about redefining and rebooting our relationship with money. Money, 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 money. It does make the world go round. And we also know that while money does buy happiness in some sense, it's not everything. And my next guest, Ross D. Blankenship, is also known as the Investing King. He is a six-time best-selling author, angel investor, and expert on billion-dollar startups. The Jobs Act, let me just do that over again, the Jobs Act, so Roy make a note to change that out, and the new crowdfunding equity investments for early stage and venture-backed startup companies. Ooh, that was a mouthful. In addition to being the expert on startups and venture capital, Ross Blankenship also advises several top cybersecurity and biotechnology companies. He has successfully raised capital for startups and been featured in TechCrunch, Mashable, and U.S. News and World Report magazine. Ross Blankenship has made more investments in venture capital before the age of 30 than most venture capitalists have made in a lifetime. Ross is the founding partner and CEO at Angel Kings, a private equity and venture capital firm focused on VC for early stage startups raising capital. Angel Kings provides angel investor and venture capitalists with the opportunity to invest in top startups. His just released book on venture capital and angel investing in America, Kings Over Aces has been called the best book on startups and angel investing. Welcome, Ross. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, that was a that was a wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. You got to keep me keep me humble and modest, would you? <laughs> wow. I mean, I'm I'm I, I'm 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 in awe. You know, first of all, let's define venture capitalism because not everybody may know what that is. So there's there's two types, right? And and I I started out as an angel investor when I was when I was thirty. So I you know been doing this for a little bit. I'm still a young guy, and I. I, an angel investor is somebody who believes in a startup and looks at things such as people, product, process, traction, financials of a startup and says, hey, I want to invest in that. And an angel investor is what I consider myself. It's somebody who believes in all four, all five components and especially the people. A venture capital uh, – I run a boutique venture capital firm. It's called Angel Kings. And what we do is we take – some of the early seed round investments we've made in, in startups, and then we make follow-up investments at a higher level. So we, we really like to stay with a startup from start, you know, in the inchoate sort of beginning stages all the way till the end, hopefully of an IPO or, you know, a billion-dollar liquidity event. And, and, and then with the angel investment, what, what are you saying is the difference? Just a little bit sure. more clarity there between so venture and angel. Earliest. So let me give you an example, Lisa. Let's say a startup – for example, and I've invested in some very early stage cybersecurity companies, companies that are protecting your mobile phones, your iPhones, your Androids, and, and these companies I've invested in will come to me and say, look, you know, we want to raise, not unlike Shark Tank, they'll come to you and say, hey, I'm so-and-so and I want to raise half a million dollars and I'm going to give you X amount of equity in our startup. 
And as an angel investor, which is what I consider myself as a believer in, in the power of the people, I say, well, let me look at your, let me look at the people, the product, the process, the financials, the traction, and put that together. And then I will invest. And that will be the first round in that, in that startup's uh, fundraising cycle. Whereas venture capital tends to be a, a, a group, which I also have at Angel Kings, that puts on follow-on rounds at Series A, B, C, D, et cetera, until an IPO. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. And what's interesting, what comes to mind is how investment has changed since the Great Recession. You know, sure. where we place our money, the reasons why we place our money, where we place yes. our money. And how has that affected your choice of a career? So, you know, my, my uh, segue into venture capital is, is a bit different in the sense that I, I had my entrepreneurial spirit at an early age. I started my first company around 1920. Um, I was fortunate enough to get accepted at Cornell University, met a bunch of really smart people, a lot smarter than me. I felt very lucky to get in there. And then I came up with this company. Um, and throughout my 20s, I built a couple of companies. I had a big success and I had also a failure that was quite, uh, quite it impacted my life and, and that you know took a toll on me. So I understand both sides of the coin. I've been a successful entrepreneur. I've been one that's failed too. Um, and I took what I had saved and all the savings that I had from my successes. And I said, you know what? I believe in people. I believe in the power of, of people's individuality and creating companies because that's the true freedom you can have is when you're your own boss, right? And, it, you know, it's, and by the way, I don't just consider success or as, as directly correlated how much money you have. I mean, time to me, Lisa, is everything. So throughout my 20s, I said, wow, I really like gr grinding and making these startups happen. And I've seen the entrepreneurial side. I've started a company, built a brand name, now I want to be on the other side and inspire vis-a-vis -vis a mentor, being a mentor and an angel investor. So that was my foray from, from starting as an entrepreneur with success, had some failures along the way, and then I decided, hey, why don't I do this and inspire others to do great things? And that's what I hear as one of the big differences in in angel investment is that it's not just about the money, that th there's a, a certain amount of social capital and belief, sure. hope, optimism that is part of the program. And that's a bit yeah. different. So, you know, first off, if, if you don't, you, there's, there's always a great idea. And, and I'm sure, I mean, look, I bet your great listeners who listen to you have, have an idea. You know, they've always wanted to do this. If, if they could just have the capital to make it happen. I mean, that's just a common core. That's a, a connection we all have. We're all entrepreneurs at our core. I mean, even if you're working for a company, I call those entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, the people that work at a company and still have an idea and want to explode and want to make that happen. Everybody at their core, I believe, is an entrepreneur. I mean, those are introverts, extroverts, ambiverts. I mean, you know, the fancy term, you're, you're much more, that's your expertise. But I, I think that everybody at their core is an entrepreneur. And I believe in the power of the people. And by the way, I believe in the power of rebounding past failure, right? Because most startups fail. And I believe that if you can identify the key points of why you failed and admit to that, you can move forward in a positive direction. I agree. And, and the, the gifts of failure, I think this is really important because so many of us limit mm -hmm. our greatness because we are afraid to fail. Yeah. Well, and, and my father once told me, he, he said he had this great attitude, tell his patients, he's a, he's a wonderful physician down in Texas, and Arkansas, Oklahoma. He's got some dialysis clinics and he's a medical entrepreneur. He's a really inspiring person. But he, he always tells people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear because he feels like, you know what? Telling people what they need here might save them in the end, right? Might make them uh, make better decisions about their lives, right? And so I take that philosophy and, I, and I've had startups pitch me. I have about 10 to 15 startups every day I say, Ross, you know, I want Angel Kings and I want you to invest in my company X amount of dollars. And they say, but I had failure. You know, I, I just want to disclose to you that along the way I hit some roadblocks and I failed. And I think the identification, the self-identification of that, that, that clear statement, concise, that I failed before is such an honest, direct, candid, need-to-hear thing that I can identify with. And I think that's the difference between me and a lot of these VCs out there just trying to you know, put some money in and get as much as they can back. I'm looking for that, that identification, that real, candid, honest conversation between the, the angel investor and the entrepreneur. And a lot of, your, a lot of the, the listeners out there, I hope, it, it can identify with that. And when we talk about angel investor, 
what I believe I hear you saying is that it doesn't necessarily require copious amounts of money. You know, it doesn't. In, in the Jobs Act, this, this Jobs Act was passed in 2012. And I've, I've you know, done some interviews on the Jobs Act. And as such, I'll just boil it down to you in a nutshell. It's passed in 2012. Obama put it through legislation. And it allows for a startup who wouldn't have had necessarily access to capital unless they went public to raise money from both accredited and or non-accredited investors. So that's the core of it. You know, before, this is 20, 30 years back, if you wanted to raise money, you better know, you should, you, you better have known somebody in this sort of big venture capital firm uh, out there. But nowadays, we're democratizing the angel investing process or, or startup investing process, rather, through new crowdfunding websites. And it's a very exciting time because, you know, you know 2000, 2012 on signified the sort of new movement towards empowering people to raise money and to also be part of those the, the startup themselves as an investor. Mm-hmm. And it does make sense because after the recession, mm-hmm. when money became very hard for people yeah. to, to get from the banks, the banking industry really clamped down on making loans. And I think it probably yeah. um, uh, incubated a whole host of VC and angel investors that came about that had money that were able to retain cash during that period. Well, at least you're absolutely right. I mean, 2008, and, and just sort of as a segue, how just to give you a, a true sense of how I can identify and empathize with people that had trouble during that time, is in 2000, I went to law school in between. So I graduated law school in 2008, and it sort of forced me into making really big decisions because I had I'd started a company before, but I wasn't quite serious about it. You know, I was doing it a little part-time, half-time, you know. And and then in 2008, the market just absolutely collapsed, as your as your listeners know. And I it made me make real decisions. And I'll tell you this much: it, that that disparity, that sort of trough in my life, made me rethink things. And it was sort of the bottom moment where I said, "Gosh, I got to pick myself up and make things happen." So that was in 2008. You're absolutely right. And I think it forced a lot of entrepreneurs to rethink their own lives and to start making decisions. Now, I will say this. And that shouldn't be the external factors should not be the reason why you make big changes in your life. OK, I just it's not, you know, these macro events are, that are out of your control, Lisa, you know, the the, the stock market's going to drop. It's going to go up and down, up and down all day. I mean, it's been doing this and, you know, this year and, and beyond. Right. But you got to make your own decisions and, and believe in yourself as an entrepreneur um, and, and don't don't rely. I mean, I did, and it worked for me. But I would encourage the people not to wait for the next crisis, right? The next mortgage crisis, the next big event where you have to tap in your savings. Do it when you're empowered, when you're feeling positive about yourself, and hopefully by listening to me and you, uh, that you get that inspiration just to do it. I mean, that's the best time to you know to go on a diet. You should go on a diet because it'll make you help if you, if you feel like you need to lose weight or want to be healthier because you need to, not because of somebody else telling you to. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. We're going to need to go to a break. And when we come back, we're going to continue the discussion with Ross D. Blankenship, the investing king. To learn more, please visit Ross at RossBlankenship.com. And on Twitter, that handle is at Ross Blankenship. Here come those tunes. We will be right back. And that is a promise. We know that life can be tough and that happiness can and does live alongside adversity. We'll be right back to explain how on Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen. Harvest more happiness by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness, following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen, and tweeting us with the hashtag Harvesting Happiness. Lisa Cypress Kamen author of Got Happiness Now, is also a prestigious TEDx presenter. Her talks, The Mysteries of Fear and the Inversion Theory of Joy, can be found online at TED.com and on the Harvesting Happiness YouTube channel. Be a part of the grateful good. Grateful Nation brings together patients, families, friends, and staff of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center to support the quality care and groundbreaking research at the Medical Center. Through new and traditional media, members of Grateful Nation share experiences, thank our caregivers and researchers, participate in sweepstakes, and gather to sponsor and host events and much more. Being grateful inspires others to be grateful as well. Isn't it time we jumpstart some perpetual gratitude? 
Visit Grateful Nation online to find out more at www.gratefulnation.org. Have a grateful day. Check out the critically acclaimed documentary film, H Factor, Where Is Your Heart? An insightful visual journey from Lisa Cypress Kamen, showing that every person possesses the means to be happy. Follow Lisa and her nine-year-old daughter, Kayla, as they travel the world on the hunt for the universal keys to human happiness. Their question, what makes you happy? Discover the origins of human happiness, where to find it, create it, and keep it. Find it in our shop at HarvestingHappiness.com. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen, the show dedicated to promoting happiness from the inside out by thriving with passion, purpose, place, and meaning. So let's get back to the show and your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. If you're just joining us now, I urge you to download and share this podcast. Why? It's kind, it's free, it's legal, it's available 24-7, and we're talking about money, 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 redefining and rebooting our relationship with money. And I'm speaking with Ross D. Blankenship, the investing king. He's also an author, and he's written a book about um, angel investment and and startups and, and what is the right time and the right way to jump on the bandwagon with investing, even if you don't have a lot of capital to do so. There are multiple ways to become a part of a project that you believe in. So, Ross, during the break, we talked a little bit about um, sure. cra- crowdfunding as one yeah. way to get into this field. Yeah, you know, and, and crowdfunding is a great way. There's all these new websites out there. I mean, at Angel Kings, we have the we rank some of these at our website, and and I think the best the best way to think think about angel investing is to break it down into five parts before you ever make an investment, which we're now empowered. You are empowered to do vis a vis the new laws. But I want you to think about it as a, as as in terms of five processes, right? So, well, five factors: people, product. Uh, execution, timing, and financials. Those sort of things come together uh, in, a, in a way that can make it more realistic because I want to say this. It is absolutely available now. Crowdfunding websites exist, but you want to make sure you do the due diligence and, and invest in people because of competency, not just loyalty. And One of the biggest reasons people lose money is because they don't have a process in place in which to evaluate vis-a-vis objective med- metrics these startups, right? So you've got it just like buying a stock, okay? You know, the difference is when I angel when I'm an angel investor, which I am in all these startups, right, through Angel Kings, okay, it's the same. I, I have my metrics, the people, product, all those things, traction, the same way you might want to buy a stock. I mean, a stock, they're really no difference. Just one is publicly traded. So if you buy a you know a publicly traded stock at Walmart, Apple, whatever it might be, there are financials behind them. And you have to understand those. You can't just blindly throw money in. And I think there's sort of a two duality here. On, one, on the one hand, it's great that we're now empowered in, as investors like me to invest in these startups. But on the other hand, you have to have a, a due diligence process, a cautious optimism about it. Because if you, if it's this, there's really that process that has to be in place. Let, let's say one goes to a crowdfunding Sure. Uh, website and sure. sees a little project, sees a, sees a product that sa- you say, oh, well, that looks like that would be good. Oh my gosh, that really will sell well. Sure. And then you pony up your hundred bucks or whatever it is that you want to invest. Okay. It, should the philosophy be that you you can afford to lose it? Well, let me let me back up a second. So so I have two two points to that, Lisa, and it's a great question about philosophy, whether you should be willing to lose it. There's two things. One, I believe I'm one of the only investors who, who will tell you and your your listener, your wonderful audience here of a, a ratio that will make total sense. And if you want to be wealthy, right, you want to have enough money not just to live paycheck to paycheck, but to go above and beyond, have a 401k, traditional Roth, all the right retirement plans in place. Well, listen to this. I believe that the ratio should be as it follows. You should have 70% of your money in publicly traded companies you know, big market cap companies and dividend paying stocks. Okay, so 70%. If you've got, let's say, let's call it a million dollars, you know, you're a million, you got a million dollars in investable assets, $700,000 should be allocated towards publicly traded companies that have a proven track record with a paying dividend and a level of what's called a PE, price to earnings ratio that's less than 15. Okay, that's actually what you should do. So 70% of your money. 20% of your money, Lisa, or, or all the money should go into real estate. 
And I believe that. I think that you should purchase a house that to just live rent to rent. You know, you don't have any equity eventually. Is it the best investment in the world? No. That's why I said 70% should be in S&P based companies. <clears throat> and then the third and fourth thing, the seven and three percent. So there's seven percent of your so so seventy twenty and then seven percent should go into high risk startups. And I know people are like, well, what do you mean by that? Well, I think you should have enough to invest like Mark Zuckerberg to invest like Larry Ellison. You know, why should we? You know, not have the democratized effect of being able to invest just like they do. How are we going to beat the S and P, Lisa? I mean, if we the S and P, which is the way we measure stock performance returns about 7% annually over 10 years. But in angel investing returns over 20 years, um, it, it actually ends up being about 23% return um, you know, over that annualized time. So I would, I would recommend to your listeners essentially to do a 70, 27, and 3 split. So 70% into publicly traded companies, 20% into real estate. Buy a house if you can, as soon as you can, and start building up equity. And then 7% should go into high-risk, high-reward startups, just like these billionaires who are making money you know, while they're sleeping because they've got these great pu- privately held you know, startups that they're investing in. And then 3% leases should be cash on hand. So if you've got a million dollars, you should have $30,000 all the time at your, at, you know, at your you know, disposal in case things happen, right? which things do happen. And it's an interesting full formula because a lot of people say, well, you know, why not just put, you know, everything in an ETF or one of these robo traders? But that's not the way to have, a, you know, a, a 50x potential, you know, 50 times return. We're talking through our angel investing massive potential. OK, nothing is guaranteed, but I just wanted to make that note. Now, the other thing is in terms of jumping in, Lisa, in terms of, you know, how your listeners could get into angel investing in this new wave of empowering investors is I would actually, and, and I'm going to plug it because I have to. I mean, our course, you know, it's it's at our website, angelkings.com backslash course. Our course gives you the fundamentals. It's, it, you know, you'll invest just a little bit of money. But let me tell you this, by, by watching over 200 startup videos, by seeing financials, term sheets, all that stuff will make it so simple for you that you'll not only want to do it, but you'll probably end up doing better as a result. So that's the best way to do it. Don't go writing five, ten thousand dollar checks until you've done your due diligence and you understand the markets and, and definitely take our course. Interesting. I didn't I didn't know you had a course and what a wonderful way to learn. I mean I'm I'm also thinking about even for the smaller investor who wants to get involved to understand the process and maybe start very, very small, there are ways to do that. You know, not everybody can write a check for five or ten thousand dollars, but right. everybody can um afford to go yeah. into these crowdfunding sources, these resources, and learn a little bit about the game. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. And and I just want to be very clear. My first check I ever wrote in a startup was about $1,000. Okay, so just to be very clear, I got my feet wet. And eventually that $1,000 become 25, become 50, became 100. And that was because of smart investing and doing my due diligence. Okay. Um, so, you know, essentially what I'm saying is this, you don't have to have, by the way, you don't have to have a million. I mean, most people don't. I mean, I'm, I'm just giving you a, a nice breakdown of 70, 20, seven and three that you can divide into. I mean, you, the same could be told, said for a hundred thousand, for 50,000. You just do the math. It's very simple. We actually have calculators on our website, which you can use. But, um, you know, Lisa, it's important to know that, you, that you'll never, you, you have to spend money to make money. I mean, yes, I don't agreed. Fertilize, right. You, I mean, if you just expect, these opportunities to come along, you're, you're blinded. I mean, it's crazy. You've got to expect to go out there and find startups, do your due diligence, and write small checks that make you feel comfortable reading a term sheet. We'll teach you how to do that at Angel Kings. And frankly, you can start small. Um, let's talk about um, what angel investors like yourself like to see from entrepreneurs. What, what kinds of businesses do you like to hear from? You know, I, I like such a, a wide range, but I have to say my – the one, the you know, there are without a doubt. There's a listener out there who's got an idea, and they, you know, they think, well, I'm going to do this this great product, and I want to sell it. I've been wanting to sell it because I know as soon as I sell it, it goes on TV. It's, I'm going to be a multimillionaire. Um, and so I want to distinguish this. There's always great ideas, right? Just as I said earlier in your show, Lisa, that there's an entrepreneur in everybody, and at, at our heart, we're all fundamentally entrepreneurs everybody's got a great idea. You've had it, whether you're working for a big company now and you're slugging, you know, pushing paper now, or you're out there trying to think, you know, if I could raise just a little bit of money. So everybody's an entrepreneur and everybody has an idea. 
The difference is execution. And so what I like to say is that if you want to raise money from somebody like me at Angel Kings or you want to pitch me on an idea, we get pitched all the time. We get about 4,000 pitches a year. We only pick about 10 of those. So that's about one in 40. So just to give you an example of how selective we are. Um, the point is this, that if you, if, if you want to know what I look for right, as an investor in great, in, in great startups, okay, what I look for is somebody who's candid, comes to me with a little bit of experience. They love some industry that they're already in, okay? They, they, they have a true passion. There are problem identifiers, and I'll, I'll explain that. There's a difference between problem solvers and problem identifiers, okay? Mm-hmm. And there are people that believe in a huge, have a big mission, okay? So let me break that down for you, Lisa. Essentially, what I'm saying is I want somebody to be right up front to say, hey, Ross, you know, I had a failure before in a startup, and I can, I can cite a bunch of them. Steve Jobs. You know, Apple, right. he, he had Lisa that failed. I mean, you know, I, I can go on and on about failures that you don't hear about because you don't hear about the successes. It's kind of a tragic thing. Um, but come to me, say, Ross, I want to raise money. I've got a product I've always been dreaming about, and I failed before, but here's what I'm going to do differently. And I've got your five things I learned about in your book, people, product, process, attraction, financial, all that stuff. And I'm going to use it. I'm going to go for it. Okay. And then furthermore, I want to say, and I want to hear them say, what is my, what's our mission? Because if you've just got a one-off product, oh, it's a great new sock for, for your feet. It makes your feet feel better. That's not a company. Okay. Right. There's a difference <laughs> between a product, Lisa, and a company. If you bring me a nice, comfortable sock that's so cool, Lisa, well, I'm going to say, well, what, what, what platform are you building? Who else is building a, a sock on top of you? Is it brand, are brands putting their logo on it? I mean, how do you build a billion dollar company? That's what you have to think. So any of your entrepreneurs can go to my site. What, that's totally fine. We get pitched a lot and I'll say, look, but don't come to me unless you have a mission and a vision to make this big. Okay. So the, the vision, you know, go, going big or go home, Texas style. <laughs> I think that that's, that's part yeah. of it too, what I hear you saying. And, and I like that because it's very, very visionary. It's, it's yeah. not being limited. So one thing I think that's so critical for the entrepreneur, the, the hungry entrepreneur out there listening to your show, Lisa, is this idea of how to measure success. How do you measure success? Is it money? Is it, is it time? Whatever. I believe fundamentally that, that there is always money connected to happiness. I mean, to some extent, you have to be able to pay for your basics, your necessities, your food, shelter, and all the clothing that makes your life, you know, simpler. Okay. But on the other hand, I want to point something out, which is that the success I've had as an angel investor, the most success has been the empowerment and the freedom of my time. And I think if you, at a certain point, there are not going to be always billion dollar companies. Not everybody's going to come up with a billion dollar company. If you have a company that ends up being a million plus year in revenue, beautiful. Find a company or build a company. You can also build a company that's a lifestyle business that provides you freedom from having a boss over your head and the time and give you, and and it'll also give you the time that you need to enjoy your life. Okay. You should. You know, that, that's just something important. I measure success and happiness, not just about uh, being as about my bank account, but also about the time, the liberation of time and the ability to manage and control my own life. So I hope that your listeners know that even though I'm an investor and I'm hungry for making big profits, at the end of the day, my time is everything. And I think the entrepreneurs need to know that. That comes from the heart. You know, I, I, I agree with you. And that is a, that is a great insight, Ross. Thank you. Thank no you problem. so much. And I'm um, here if you guys need anything else. So thank you. And um, yeah. We are out of time, Ross. And sure. I want to thank you for, for joining us on the show. I want to also give our listeners the, the name of the book once again. It's sure. Kings Over Aces. And yeah. it's been called one of the best books on startups and angel investing. To learn more about Ross Blankenship and his work, please visit rossblankenship.com. And on Twitter, that handle is at Ross Blankenship. And here are a few thoughts before we part. Happiness is not a destination. It cannot be bought, sold, or traded. Happiness will never invite you to the party. Happiness simply comes down to a choice to show up each and every day in the world with passion, purpose, place, and meaning. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. This is Lisa cypress Cayman and my amazing guests today, Teresa Gilarducci and Ross Blankenship, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio is produced in collaboration with TogiNet and KBUU and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange. Go out and make it a great day. 
Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio with Lisa Cypress Kamen. Join us each and every Wednesday for a brand new broadcast and continue to harvest your own happiness anytime from the comfort of wherever you are with hundreds of free downloadable podcasts from our libraries on iTunes and SoundCloud. To learn more about Lisa's global practice as an applied positive psychology coach specializing in lifestyle management as well as addiction and trauma recovery services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness, following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen, and tweeting us with the hashtag Harvesting Happiness.